Um, we're going to now move on to um, talking about the pollinator posse. Um, thank you so much, Tora and Terry, for coming to join us and tell us about your group. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to work a little bit with these guys um, in our East Bay Monarch work group, which I will talk about a little bit later. Um, they are educators. They go out and um, you know, go into classrooms and go to nurseries and uh, talk to people about these really important issues, some of which Hillary uh, brought up. Um, and I will let them take it away. Thanks, Lisa. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So as uh, Lisa said, I'm Terry Smith from the Pollinator Posse, and Tora Rocha is also here. I'm going to let Tora go ahead and introduce herself and give her background, and then we'll go on from there. Hi, I'm Tora Rocha, the co-founder of the Pollinator Posse. I was a retired I'm retired now. I was a park supervisor for the city of Oakland. I'm also a gardener for the city of Oakland for 37 years. Um, I was stationed mostly at Lake Merritt and downtown and the botanical gardens um, where the posse started. Um, I'm now the, the president, the co-president of the Friends of the Gardens at Lake Merritt. I'm also the founder of the Autumn Lights Festival, which is the fund, the one and only fundraiser for that garden. And uh 2019 i won the jefferson award for doing my pollinator outreach um and also for the autumn lights festival for that um i'm sort of the landscape maintenance guru and garden planning um for the posse and terry is the other half of this so i'll let terry do the rest so as Tor said, I'm the, also the co-founder of the Posse, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, my background is as a STEAM education specialist, science, technology, at um, engineering, arts, and math. Um, I was an uh, elementary teacher for 25 years. I taught K-5 science, math, and technology, in addition to classroom uh, instruction, and did a lot of curriculum development. Um, in my limited spare time, I'm an artist. Um, I work in watercolor and now in silk and eco printing and natural dyes. You can see in the picture, those are um, 16 times life size models of actual butterflies that lived in the garden um, done in silk. And you'll see a little more about that. I'm also the president of Community for Lake Merritt, which is the um, friends support group for the wildlife refuge at Lake Merritt and the nature center there. And I'm a pretty avid gardener. So the posse, our focus is on outreach and education, habitat creation, uh, community science, and then we collaborate and coordinate with a lot of organizations. Um, we've learned we need to describe ourselves and we work with a lot of these big uh, nonprofits that we are a local volunteer grassroots organization. Uh, we're based in Oakland, but we pretty much cover all of Northern California right now. Um, and we're a Monarch joint venture partner um, and we work closely with National Wildlife Foundation, Xerxes, and Western Monarch Advocates. So um, that collaboration and coordination is really important. But basically, it's Tora and I uh, heading up the organization and then volunteers we can draw in. And so any of the things you hear about today, any of the things we do, if you'd like to get involved, please uh, just go to our website and sign up. So speaking of our website, which looks pretty out of date, but is in the process of being redesigned, um, we have a lot of resources out there um, that I'll talk about. So you can go to the resources page. Um, to, if you want to get in touch with us, the contact form just sends an email to me, super easy. Um, we um, have a pretty large Facebook presence. We have about 1,500 people. Oh, I guess it's 1,600 there. In our on our group online on Facebook, which is uh, pretty active. Um, we're also on Instagram. And then we have an email list with about 800 people. So we have a pretty significant reach, uh, particularly in the Bay Area and then out through Northern California. And you're welcome to join any of those groups. Um, our focus is on native pollinators. We do mention uh, honeybees uh, when we're out talking, but we're much more concerned about native bees which Hillary talked about. Serpent flies have become a really big interest lately, second only to bees and their pollinating skills. And then the butterflies and moths, um, we talk about a lot. 
Um, but of course, the honeybees and the monarchs have the best PR. I love this cartoon. Sure, when you gather with your friends, it's breathtaking, but locusts get together and it's a plague. Um, so often what we're called to talk about are monarchs. Um, and then we bring in all this other information. For example, one of our favorite things is to talk about uh, these red admiral butterflies, which need pellitory, which is this weed that most of us pull out regularly in order for their um, larva to survive. So it's not just about milkweed. Um, and I actually, I was just watching a red admiral in my garden the other day, guarding the patch of pellitory I now leave for them. We also have a large project promoting uh, bringing the pipevine swallowtail back into Oakland where it's been extirpated for a length of time. Um, and these are actually some pictures from my garden where we've had um, success for the last four years. So we're encouraging planting of that host plant as well. So we're much broader than monarchs, although that's often our entry drug. Um, a lot of what we do, and, and especially initially, we did tabling at events. Um, I forgot to mention the posse formed about 12, 10, 12 years ago when Tora and I met in the gardens at Lake Merritt. And um, it's sort of grown from there. Um, so one of the big things we do is tabling at events. This is um, the Heirloom Festival up in Santa Rosa where we have about 1100 kids come through our booth in three days. Um, and they're making these little Airbnbs. Uh, they color these little um, quote unquote bird houses and then we put the straws in for the bees. So we're doing um, native bee education there and they have something to take home. Uh, when we have a little lower budget, we use these colored toilet paper tubes for them as well. Um, we also go out with what we call our mini museum. Um, we use these little $10 microscopes that we put things like bee heads and butterfly wings in and things and uh, people get to look at those. We have some um, no longer living samples that we've collected uh, and general education about pollinators um, that we do at these events. It's pretty popular and you can see it's kind of targeted toward kids, but adults get a big kick out of it as well. Um, and then we have this, my personal pet peeve is that very few people understand what pollination is. Uh, without fail, I will be doing something with kids and the adults in the background will go, oh, that's what's going on. Um, and so this, I really uh, worked to create some activities for different settings uh, to explain what pollination is and why it's important. So um, this is a finger puppet activity. We, we use these um, big flower models that show the parts uh, and then the kids with their choose their pollinator finger puppet and we do a little pollination and then they get the reward just like the pollinator. Again, if we have budget, we do honey sticks, but if not, we do these wax nectar sticks that they get as a reward for pollinating that day. Um, and then we have a little simpler version of we, that we do where we put this cheddar cheese powder on this wreath from Michael's and they make a little bee puppet with their finger uh, and carry the pollen to a flower and again, get a reward. Um, we do a lot of talks and classroom visits and field trips. Uh, this is a very brave fourth grade teacher who let us do uh, seed balls in her classroom. Um, and this is these are field trips at the gardens at Lake Merritt. So those are all um, things that we offer. And we're actually um, working on a um, project, as Lisa sort of mentioned. Um, we got a grant with the California RCDs this year for me to create a lesson and teach people to do it, to do classroom visits on pollination, taking a lesson I've been doing for years um, and packaging it up so other people can go out and do it. So we're excited about that, um, leveraging out what we do. Um, on our website, of course, since COVID, we haven't been doing as many in-person things, and that's given us an opportunity to put recordings on our website. Um, the talk that we do, which is uh, more of a layman's version of what Hillary went through uh, today about pollinators and why they're important and what are the important ones and what you can do. Um, we have recordings of that talk. We go out and do that talk for groups. We talked to um, 2,000 people last year, everything from kindergarten classes to permaculture classes at college level, garden groups, neighborhood groups, um, pretty much anyone who calls, um, we, we're willing to go and talk and can tailor that talk to the particular group. Um, this is a, a, a recording that's also on our website, Mama Wanda's Garden School, which is the pollination lesson 
uh, done with a puppet and a kid. That was fun to do. And um, there's also a great Bay Curious um, podcast interview we did that uh, really goes over the monarch situation in the Bay Area. Um, we've also gotten into doing virtual field trips. This is, was a collaboration with Oakland Unified School District. Uh, during COVID, they wanted to get kids and families out into parks. Uh, so we tailored lessons that they could do in particular parks in Oakland, uh, just watch it on their phone and then do some activity. Um, so this is that classroom lesson I mentioned with the par partnership with the California RCDs, um, which was funded by an MJV and US Forest Service grant. So we're excited about that. Um, we also have a bunch of resources that we bring with us and we have available on our um, website. Uh, this little butterfly figure puppet for the younger kids, how to draw a butterfly or a bee um, for older groups where they're learning some of the terminology for the parts, these little masks, and those things are all just downloadable. Um, and then we've gotten very involved since 2020 in community science. Um, in 2020, as Hillary mentioned, the monarch population dropped <laughs> ridiculously. And we also saw a lot of change in behavior in the Bay Area. Monarchs, at times we hadn't seen them before, breeding at times we hadn't seen before. And in an effort to kind of make people aware, we put out a survey, we got about 140 responses, and we produced um, this data out to people to document what we were seeing, um, which was breeding all during the summer, which was not typical uh, in the Bay Area before. Normally, we just saw them in the spring and the fall as they were passing through. Um, we looked at the kinds of milkweed that were available, um, and we also looked at um, people rearing monarchs, which, as Hillary mentioned, is not legal in California anymore, um, but it was going on, and we think it had a significant impact because people were rearing them indoors where they didn't get the cues they needed to know was migration time. Um, I thought that was a one-shot deal. It turned out when I put it out, it was like, this is great. You need to do more of that. So we're continuing to do that, gathering data on milkweed types, uh, observed caterpillars, um, people who are rearing, even though we, it's not something we encourage, but if they're doing it, we ask them to report their data. And um, we're gathering that data on a regular monthly basis, but that's gotten to be a lot of work for me. And um, also the data is not in a form it's particularly useful to researchers. Um, so I now have been doing a lot of training uh, and recruiting people to participate in the Monarch Larval Monitoring Project, um, which on the map below, it looks like there's quite a few sites in California, but actually those have not been, most of those haven't been active. So I actually just met with the Botanical Garden in Berkeley. They're gonna, volunteers are gonna start doing it. I'm training people to do it in their yards. Um, if you have community gardens, that's, that have pollinator habitat, this is a really uh, great way to do it. And you can sign up on our website for a training. I have about an hour long training. One is recorded there, but I'm also happy to do them for groups or individuals who need who, to get you started. Um, and it's just a weekly monitoring project. I do it in my garden. It takes me about 15, 20 minutes a week uh, to go out and gather the data and enter it. So we're encouraging that. Um, so we do have a sense of what's happening year round in the Bay Area. And I'm gonna hand it over to Tora. Let me give you a slide. Oh. So um, as I said in the beginning, I'm the founder of the Autumn Lights Festival. Here's a few pictures of the Autumn Lights Festival. It's the only funding um, and fundraiser we do for that garden where the posse grew out of. Um, and this is Terry's display. Um, I can't take any credit for it, except that I just came up with the idea of the festival. Um, her hand painted silk. And there's also another um, display um, that we do in other, um, like in the mayor, when the mayor was re-inaugurated, she asked us to show up and bring the silk butterflies. And this is at the Rotary Nature Center. Um, it's just a real good, we noticed that, you know, the visual of having these butterflies right next to you and then explain what they are and that they're native is really important. Um, we get a lot of people come up to our booths wherever we are because of Terry's fabulous butterflies. So um, and this is one we did, we added this year to Autumn Lights Festival. We had kids in a um, Studio One art class called Tinker's Corner. 
paint um, these little Airbnbs, as we call them for the single moms of the bee world, the solitary bee, um, paint them. And then we had a light that showed what um, people see. And then we had the UV light hit them. And we had the kids put UV ink on the butterfly, I mean, on the houses. So we could see this is what bees see versus this is what um, the people see. Next. Um, and then another event I came up with is because I really, I have a very strong um, commitment to trying to convince golf horses to go organic and become critical habitat for our communities instead of heavy polluters. So I started an event called Teas for Bees where we have kids hit seed balls that have the California, um, the regionally specific wildflower mix for whatever golf course we're um, at. Um, they make seed balls and then we have them hit them into the open space of the golf course and they yell for the bees when they're hitting it with the golf clubs. And that was one of the reasons I won the Jefferson Award was for that event. And they came out and filmed it um, and it was really fun. Um, the mayor took the mayor's monarch pledge for National Wildlife Federation and she's done it several years now. Um, and last year she declared May 22nd, 2021 Pollinator Posse Day and gave us a proclamation from um, the mayor's office in the city hall. And in turn, this triggered training, monarch training and milkweed training for all the park services staff so that they wouldn't be removing or weed eating milkweed down when it's starting to come up. So it's, it's really good if you can get your local officials to make some kind of pledge because it is a trigger effect. It will work its way down into the maintenance level and that's what's really important. Um, time to shift the paradigm. We don't dress like this. I love Terry's slide that she came up with. You know, we don't dress like this, so why are we still looking, you know, landscaping like this? And so our efforts are to convince people that we need to go from con conquering the landscape to stewardship of the landscape. And my biggest thing is to get people, if you have your hands in the dirt, that you are not just a gardener or a landscaper or a planner or whatever, you are a steward of your local ecosystem and you need to learn how your landscape practices are affecting it. Um, and that's our main thing I want to do. Um, also as landscapers and, um, and architects, anybody who's out there, um, the importance of signage can change the perception of what we're doing. As a park supervisor, I used to have people email me all day long a week long about why, you know, why aren't you weeding this section around Lake Merritt? And I would go out there and it'd be plantain and thistle. So I would put that sign that's in the up, upper left-hand corner, pardon our weeds or preserving pollinator habitat. The same 50 people would email me and say, thank you for what you're doing. So we, as, you know, park people, we have the power of perception. You know, um, that's my big pet peeve is is weeds, why do we call, you know, things like plantain? I talk about plantain a lot in my talks. Um, it's the host plant for the buckeye butterfly. And Hillary was just saying, I mean, um, yeah, Hillary's talking about people don't see buckeyes anymore. It's because we're weeding the plantain out of our lawns. Um, I wanna see people um, weeding the lawn out of their plantain. I mean, it's also in Chinese medicine, you can make a tea and it treats asthma or you can make a poultice and it treats a bee sting. So plantain's a really important plant, not the lawn. So um, signage is everything. Um, I had an epiphany that my work was directly affecting local pollinators when I learned about solitary bees and then the solitary and their wood cavity nesting needs. And I was removing the deadwood in parks to make the park safe for humans. And that's when I decided to create this Airbnb. It was originally called a bee hotel like everybody else, but I had Airbnb volunteers working in the garden that day. And I said, oh, this is our um, B hotel. And they're like, we don't do hotels. We're the Airbnb. And I was like, oh, Airbnb. And so that's how it got nicknamed Airbnb. And we tell everyone when we're doing this that we're helping the single moms of the bee world. Um, convincing people to use natives. I always say that you have to use at least 75% natives when we started adding more native plants and some um, went, wait, late blooming nectar plants is when we started getting monarchs in the garden. I had not seen them in there before. Um, and so convincing people and having these demonstration gardens where people can see California native plants that look beautiful 
in a setting is really important. Year-round nectar is key, especially in the Bay Area. Um, we have monarchs all year long practically now, but mostly in the winter time is when they're coming in. And we need a lot more winter blooming nectar. So when people are asking us about how to preserve monarchs, we want to push the winter blooming nectar more than the milkweed because the milkweed, they, they have that. Um, and so here's a few that I love. Um, I do a lot of outreach to professionals. Um, here I am training the city staff after the Monarch Pledge. Um, we're training them about what milkweed looks like when it's first coming up, because that's when it's important not to weed eat it out. That's when the monarchs are laying their eggs because it's early spring. I also had leafcutter bee cocoons, and I had the staff release the leafcutter bees in their hands so that they could see that they don't sting and that you don't have to worry. It's not a hive. It's a solitary female. The photo on the left was me teaching municipal and um, private landscapers and architects at the Bay Friendly Training, which is now considered Rescape Training. I highly recommend any of these agencies to get all the maintenance staff um, to get certified in the Rescape California um, certification program, because what I'm seeing the most is that you can plan and you can promote and you can put all this um, these uh, habitat in, but then if you get a turnover in your staff and you don't have good training, they're just going to wipe it out. So it's really important that the maintenance staff is engaged in understanding what the planning, what you're trying to do in the habitat. They just, they just want to get their job done and that means to get the weeds down. And we all know host plants are mostly weeds, fennel, Yampa, they don't identify. I can't tell you how many times I put Yerba Buena in that garden and it got hand weeded out. It's like, it's, you know, we just have to train the maintenance staff, not just the architects and the planners. We really need to train them. Um, community garden collaborations. Lately, I've been asked to do a lot of um, consulting for like starting a community garden. So now it's sort of another thing that we offer. And it's so, sort of just what I was talking about making these MOUs, these memorandums of understanding with agencies so that when we put in pollinator habitat that they don't just wipe it out when it becomes ugly or when they don't, when they have a new supervisor or whatever. But um, that's kind of what I'm working on right now. This is a soldier garden in Auburn. You see the little Airbnbs on the fence. Um, that's a community garden um, to help soldiers heal from PTSD. And so we put a little butterfly garden in there and we were working closely with Moraga for Monarchs, which is, um, they had been rearing Monarchs in their backyard, this group, it's like a garden club and they all shared a bunch of diseased Monarchs and they all died. And so they reached out to us because they were all like frantic and they ended up, <clears throat> they wanted to raise $30,000 to do this little community garden for Monarchs out in the dog park area in Moraga and they ended up raising 90,000. So it tells you how important monarchs are right now. Um, and the city manager from Santa Clara asked me to come up and work with their community garden um, collaborator um, to help them talk about pollinators. Um, she had been working in Oakland as a city manager and was raising caterpillars with me with the posse. So it's, it's kind of cool that these other cities are now, this whole thing is like rippling down. So. We're busy. <laughs> um, here's some interviews. We were recently in the Washington Post, which just kind of blew our mind. Now we see it, it was also in the Guam Post and the Anchorage, Alaska Daily News. And we're getting questions from like almost everywhere. Terry's picture and face ended up on a plant sale <laughs> flyer in, in ha East Hamptons. It's like, it's really, you know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's exciting and interesting, but um, we're super busy and we could use some more volunteers. So um, ask us if you want to help. Right now I'm getting ready to be on a panel for the Water Boards of California um, in June and also doing um, stormwater runoff for Sacramento on how to, um, to do a webinar for them. So we're getting asked a lot. So um, anyway, here's a plant list I came up with. I realized that most of the, um, you know, gardening for pollinators and stuff is usually written by entomologists. So it was sort of hard for like the average gardener to deal with. 
So this is a plant list I came up with, uh, mostly plants from the Bees and Blooms of California, Dr. Frankie's book. And um, these are the months that they're bloom in the color that they bloom so that it's easy to come up with 365 days of nectar and color um, because it's super important. Um, my number one plant, the verbena um, delamina, which now it's not a verbena anymore. I can't remember what it's called, but that plant, I talk about it so much because it's 365 days of nectar and the, butter, the monarchs are crazy about it, but so are bees. Um, the nurseries can't keep it in stock hardly because I talk about it so much. So getting, getting out there and getting the word out and getting these plant lists out are super important. Um, now we're doing, we're giving away fascicularis seed, um, narrow leaf milkweed seed at seed libraries, trying to get people to switch out their tropical milkweeds in the Bay Area to grow um, the native milkweed and teaching people. Um, my, the big curious interview um, for KQED was because people keep asking Big curious, why is native milkweed so hard to grow versus tropical milkweed? And we want to teach people that actually, if you do the narrow leaf, it's really easy to grow by seed. Um, it's just that they're rhizomatous and it takes a couple years underground to really get established. You just have to be a little more patient. Um, this is my mother's garden. When my mom passed away, she told me she didn't want a headstone with her name on it. She wanted a butterfly garden where her grand great grandkids and grandkids will go look at flowers and butterflies and think of her. And when I announced that $8,000 came to the garden and I built this California native habitat garden in her name. And it just made me go to think like, why aren't we doing this more often? Like, why aren't we, instead of dumping money into cemeteries, let's put it in public land and make pollinator habitat in honor of our loved ones. So um, I created this and wanted to make sure people realize how important a water feature is. And the cobbles are from the 1850s. They came out of the 7th Street Bar West, um, West Oakland BART restoration. And I asked them to keep them so we can use them for a rockery. Native bees love to nest at the base of them. The beetles, salamanders, frogs, everything needs that little rockery to hide out in. And you know the grasses, all of that. Um, we like to teach that and I wanted to put it in a demo garden. So you can go see that now if you want, it, the gardens at Lake Merritt. Um, it was a little three-year-old that taught me why butterflies are important. He said, Tora, you know why butterflies are important, don't you? And I'm like, no, Cole, tell me. He's like, they're the fairies of our earth. They fly just like Tinkerbell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tora and Terry. And uh, Tora, thank you for sharing about your mom. That is an amazing tribute, I think, to, to a person um, and a wonderful way to celebrate their memory. Um, does anyone have any questions? I know I definitely have some, but um, I know there's one in the chat um, from Hillary and- uh, Yes, Hillary, you're, we do, we do um, we're redoing the, B, the Airbnb now. Um, what we're gonna do, because we've realized like everyone else that Besides not just disease, it's the, you know, it's the pair the predatory problem too. We had paper wasps just move in. So what we're going to do is take some of those squares and put signage up. So I'm looking for um, some, actually some help <laughs> with some signage, Hillary, if you have any, um, just to put on the bee hotel, because really I built that to get people to talk about native bees. That went after I had my epiphany, because I realized I already work with all these landscapers in the Bay Friendly Training, and I would do this talk. Not once would anyone know how many native bees are in California. And I did that for years. I mean, that's thousands and thousands of people in the trade that they're like, they could own the only native bee they could come up with would be bumblebee. But they had no idea about wood cavity nesters and how when they remove the deadwood, they and also about using weed cloth. And I mean, it, I just got. I have to make a difference. And I wanted something that was strong, a strong visual, and it had to be pretty because it's, you know, a show garden. So um, that's why we came up with that. But we are shifting now and we're going to be changing out the wood and the reeds every two years. Um, that's the way, but it did get used. I have pictures of leaf cutter bees um, and paper wasps fighting it out. So. Well, and when we do our talks, we, we share that, that this is actually a super spreader event. We learned our lesson as we do as we go along. 
and um, we share different ways to do bee hotels. And we've actually, um, if anybody has not seen my Garden of a Thousand Bees on PBS, run out to see it. Um, it's please, a, please, please. <laughs> it's a, we're actually working on a promotion with the Berkeley Library right now, but um, it, it's a one hour documentary. A, a, one of David Attenborough's videographers was stuck in his backyard uh, for the duration of COVID and invented all these ways to film the native bees. Um, and it's it's mind blowing. It's just spectacular. So um, that's a that's something we've been promoting as well. And his little bee hotels or he's got things drilled. He's got stuff all over the place. That's awesome. Thank you. Hillary also thanks you for the info and um, mentions that Xerxes has a handout on the bee hotels if you're interested in checking that out. Um, and Igor, help a bee help a bee .org has really good stuff too. Um, it's doc, um, Dr. Gordon Frankie's, you know, site. And so there's a lot of information there too. Um, Great. Getting, you know, getting people to not buy them at Costco and do a little yeah. more investigation is the really the important part. Great point. Thank you. Um, so Igor, please go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, ladies, this is just absolutely marvelous. <laughs> I'm completely blown away. And it really touched uh, my heartstrings when you talked about the memorial for your mother. And I was thinking of my own parents who were buried in a place with stone and grass. Uh, I myself planned to have my ashes scattered in, in a redwood grove, but uh, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we've done some of that kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, what you've done is taking it to another level altogether. And that's quite amazing. Well, um, it, it and she and she kept the conversation going on in my family. It wasn't just me. Um, like this weekend, we did the open house at Morning Sun Herb Farm, and I had a booth up there. And her grand, her great grandchildren were there running the booth with me. They were eleven and ten, and you know they all do it in honor of my mother. So it's pretty amazing. They're getting their Girl Scout badges by working the booth and teaching little kids about native bees and. It was really heartwarming to hear my 10 year old great niece say, you wanna do our activity on solitary bees? You know, it was really, it was really, you know, and that's because of that whole, you know, making it important in your family to yeah. um, do the right thing. We did that kind of thing with the planting of native oaks. Right. And uh, the, the grandkids would come on grandpa's birthday and come decorate the native oak. Yeah, the tree planting is another, yeah. you know, that's one thing I'd like to, that I didn't really, we talked a little bit about, and we talked more about with Hillary is when you're doing these plantings and stuff and, and at the state level, especially what we've seen, the clash that I've witnessed myself because I'm in, you know, the pollinator posse, but I'm also in another um, group called Common Vision, which puts school garden, school orchards in. Um, the fact that everybody, there's all these Cal Fire grants for planting trees, but we can't find wholesale trees that aren't treated with ne neonics. And if we mm. have millions and millions and millions of trees getting planned in with these grants that are covered with neonics, there's not going to be any hope for the pollinators. And that we have to stop this clash and this train wreck before it happens. And that's really my main goal right now is to get these nurseries. And if you guys are sourcing plants it's us it's the consumer the one buying from the wholesalers that actually has the power that we need to tell them it's not and if, especially if it's oaks it's unethical to spray a no, native oak with neonics i mean i'm sorry that should be a huge fine so um but this is us if we're in there telling talking to these wholesale nurseries and being passionate and tell them we're just not going to buy your product period you need to do the right thing that like, I would love all of you in this group because the watersheds are directly affected by that. It stays in the ground for eight years. I mean, come on, but this like, we have the power to change that perception. Like I did with that sign about the weeds. So please talk to your local nursery, your wholesale nurseries. That's really important information. And uh, I'll tell you, ours was not raised in a nursery, so at least we're good with that one. <laughs> you know, save your acorns, all of you, in your open spaces. <laughs> save your acorns. We have to start our own nurseries, I think. It's like, I did have a, not... uh, 
a potential uh, maybe an additional partner you might consider working with, and that's the Mountain View Sanitary District. Uh, there's a small sanitary district in the Martinez area, and they've won awards for using their effluent to create wetlands. Yeah. They're actually just now getting started on a like a 20 or 30 year re rejuvenation of their wetland plantings. And this would be a good time to uh, engage with them and get them nudged more yeah, towards the, the pollinator aspect well, it, of the plantings. And, in, and it's just sourcing your plants, like make sure that like, um, I think Lisa even said it, but Xerxes has a fabulous the whole like tons of information on how to talk to your nursery about neonics and, and pesticides and we just need to get the word out to everybody who's buying plants like especially in the large scale like we talk to the the homeowners but i'm talking about planners and architects and and it's the contractors themselves like who are sourcing these plants especially if you get a grant to plant a hundred thousand trees i'm working with the hundred thousand trees for humanity group right now because I had to stop them because they just got 1.8 million to plant trees. I'm like, no. <laughs> so first let's find some trees that don't. So like anybody, if like getting the information, if you know wholesale, especially trees, wholesale tree growers that are not using neonics, let, you know, share the information with Lisa and Hillary and so that we can get that information out. <clears throat> yeah, that's really important. Yeah, thank you so much. Great questions. Um, did want to mention that uh, John Steer thanks you for the the presentation and, and is asking if you could potentially put some links into the chat maybe for uh, the pollinator posse and maybe your um, your plant list as well that would be really helpful. Um, well, the, plant, the plant lists are on the website. I will put the website in the chat. Perfect. Everything perfect. we talked about today is on the website. And it's all under resources. Perfect. Trying to do every, yeah, it's trying and we're about to rebuild it, so it's going to look completely different pretty soon but that's the whole point is to make it as simple as possible and free and easy access but all the content is there it's just not very pretty right now <laughs> and I, and, okay. and I don't have an ego in it so if you see things if you're one of these biologists and you're out in the and you see a plant that should be on that list please let me know you know I'm not I'm this was done with an intern um so um and I'm always up for learning more. Um, I do want to talk about California milkweed. Um, it, we've been able to propagate it pretty easy here by seed up here with the master gardeners in Auburn. Um, but I do think the trick is going to be a lot like cordifolia that when you guys buy and grow Californica, um, Dudleyas and cordifolia and all these other plants, they like to grow on their side because they're used to growing in the cliffs. So don't plant them, you know, make sure you're using a really, really grainy cactus mix um, and try to grow them like where they can grow on a 45 degree angle. And you'll see that they'll take off faster. Um, it's a little trick that we're, I, I, I learned it with Dudleyas and now I use it on Cordifolia. Now we're seeing, and you have to use a deep, a deep um, pot. They do not do well in six packs. It's like, it needs to be a tree liner. So. We are learning and um, just keep sharing information, please. Thank you for those tips. Um, and also somebody asked if, if we're recording, we are recording these presentations so we can share them out later on. Um, did anyone else have any questions before we move on? Um, I definitely just wanted to say that, um, you know, we at the RCD are really lucky to be one of four RCDs that are um, working with uh, Terry on on this uh, the grant that she mentioned um, through CARCD and Monarch Joint Venture. Um, so I'm one of the lucky ones who got to actually get trained by Terry on her um, amazing lesson for second graders, and I'm really excited to get into the classroom next year um, and uh, talk to all the second graders. So if you have any um, friends who are teachers or people who are you know, teachers or no teachers in Contra Costa um, and, and think they might be interested in having a, a lesson on monarchs for their, for their students, please just uh, let me know. Um, and I think, uh, did anyone else have anything before we move on? Um, thank you so much, Terry and Tora. This is really great. And um, I'm just really excited to, to see your work and see the, the, intersection of, you know, your education and 
information access landscaping and art is just it's just everything so thank you so much <laughs> thank you yeah. you're very welcome and if you know groups that want to hear you know we're we're happy just contact us through the website and we're happy to arrange something we have very many versions of our talk at this point <laughs> And there's, Thank you. we're doing, we're doing several things in the Bay Area events and we need more volunteers. So if any of you want to come out, you know, like we have a tease for bees on May 22nd and, you know, we're doing the bird and butterfly festival, at Coyote Hills. So we always have, you know, a need for more people sitting in these things. So please contact us if you're interested and we'll send you our sign up genius event um, schedule. Well, it's, it's on the website too. And also, you know, if you want to use any of these activities, you're welcome to do it. And the easiest way is to come volunteer and see how it runs, and then you can take it and use it other places. Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you.